to be his special people, his chosen people. And many of them were actually predestinated. They were chosen before they were ever born. And uh, talk about predestination a little bit in this lesson. As a matter of fact, when I go to India next year, they've asked me to teach on the subject of predestination. So some, a lot of this foundation work is, is going to be very good for that. Uh, predestination is a biblical concept. But we need to make sure we teach it the way the Bible does and not the way men do. Um, we got kind of to the top of page 10. I think we kind of got through the first paragraph of it uh, on Sunday morning. So let's just begin then at the second one uh, talking about John the Baptist. And what was John's purpose for being sent to this earth by God? Okay. Well, didn't all of the prophets prepare the way for Christ? Yeah, they did. Um, but uh, it took, you know, God had a plan. And oftentimes we look at his plan and we, we would have done things differently. You know, I mean, frankly, I would have done things differently. And it, I'm pretty sure it probably wouldn't have worked at all. Uh, but God knows what he's doing, and he set a, a plan up. And uh, what did John the Baptist say, question number four, about stones and Abraham's children? Okay. This is a... When I read this statement... Here, I read this question, I got to thinking about it. Something clicked in my mind. And, you know, sometimes these things click in my mind and they really don't go anywhere. So, pardon me if you don't think that I have anything to say here, but I'm going to say it anyway. Somebody turn to Matthew chapter 16. Let's read verses 17 through 19. Matthew chapter 16. And we'll read verses 17 through 19. Okay. Um, I will, you are Peter, and upon this rock, or stone... I will build my church. So John said that God could raise from the stones children to Abraham and Jesus says upon this stone as it were I'm going to build my church. Something else just occurred to me and this, this just clicked in my mind. This may or may not fit here but when the devil was tempting Jesus what did the devil tell Jesus to do with the stones on the ground? Turn them into bread. Jesus, Jesus refused to do that. Something interesting about the stones. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 2 and let's read verses 4 through 10. Oh. 
I don't know. I mean, this is, this is speculation on my part. I'm going to admit that. But I just wonder if when Jesus, or when John said that, that of these stones on the ground, God can raise up seed to Abraham. Now that was said by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. I wonder if he was thinking of what Peter was talking about here when he said that. I don't know. And maybe he was setting this up. And, and I, think, I think there is an indication that John was trying to begin to indicate to these people, these Jews, that there were going to be people who were going to become children of Abraham that the Jews wouldn't call children of Abraham. The Gentiles were going to be brought into the kingdom. You have something? Yeah. Uh huh. And, and really the point that Peter is making is the same point. Here's the stone that was rejected of men that God made the chief cornerstone. And that stone made these stones of the ground in the children of Abraham. And caused them to become a holy temple to God. Uh, what, did, what were the Jews called when God chose them originally? God said that they would be a what? A holy nation and they would be a kingdom of priests. Did they live up to that? Not at all. But here Peter says, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Now we're not just a kingdom of priests, but we're royal priests, Peter says. We are priests who are actually kin to the king himself. Um, so we, we are ruling priests, as it were. Um, but we're those stones that were rejected. And the chief cornerstone, who was also rejected, turned around and made us into the stones that build up the building of God. And how, how did this come about? How did, how did the Gentiles, we, become these chosen stones? Turn to Isaiah chapter 55 and let's read verses 6 through 11. Somebody besides Don, wear out his voice here tonight. <laughs> Isaiah 55 verses 6 through 11. Go ahead. Okay, so how does God affect this making of the stones of the ground seed to Abraham? The what? Four letter word. Give you a big hint. <laughs> the word. Now, in the beginning... God did what? 
What? How did he do that? He said that he spoke his word. He does everything by the word, doesn't he? From the beginning right on down through, he does everything by the word. And his word is going to go forth out of his mouth, and it's not going to return to him empty. It's going to always accomplish his will. Yeah, he did. No question about it. <laughs> okay. When John the Baptist was preparing the way, he worked within God's word that had been spoken at that time and within that framework. God, God had a certain method to his madness, if you will. Sometimes we call our works. And uh, he, when Jesus came upon the earth, he called upon his Jewish brethren to repent in chapter 4 and verse 17, didn't he? Repent. What is repentance? It's a change, okay? But it's simple. one word, a change, a turning from, turning to something else. So that would be a change. So he told them to change. What did they need to change? Yeah, because the first commandment was what? First commandment with promise is what? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God. Okay? That's it. And the Jews didn't do that. So Jesus is telling them, you've got to turn. And you've got to begin to love God with all of your heart, your soul, and your mind. But uh, but there is there's something here that's telling the, the Jews that they're not the only ones that are going to be in this kingdom, in this included in God's chosen people in a very short order. Now, um, Jesus, when he walked upon this earth, he kept the law of Moses perfectly. He didn't violate one commandment of it. Because Jesus was a Jew. You know, a lot of people... Uh, a lot of there, there was a big. I don't know. Was it ten or fifteen years ago? There was a big thing in the news about you know the anti-Semitism. You know because the Christians were teaching that the Jews killed Jesus. Well, Jesus was a Jew. Yeah, he was killed by the Jews, but Jesus himself was a Jew. So there's no anti-Semitism in telling the truth. There, that's that's just foolishness. But uh, he <clears throat> he kept the law of Moses perfectly. But he knew that this institution and this system that had been set up was not the be-all to end-all, as it was, were, but it was a means to a greater end. And he gave his disciples all kinds of clues that that was going to be the case. Yes, Don?
People want to major in minors too much. Um, <clears throat> but Jesus, when he kept that system, he warned his people, the people that were listening to him, not to do as the leaders of the Jews were doing, the scribes, the Pharisees, and the other leaders of the Jews. Because, yes, they would, they would keep the law of Moses as far as it seemed good to them at least. But they often threw these traditions in there and, and they, they demanded that, that the people of God be a sort of a card-carrying society. And their idea of this was that, well, you know, I got my card right here that says I'm a Jew, so I'm one of God's children. You know, that enters me into the club. And uh, that wasn't what God ever wanted from them. As a matter of fact, in the book of Malachi, what did God say he wished somebody would do to the doors of the temple? Remember? Anybody? Close them up and lock them so nobody could get in there to worship. Because he said, you're just polluting my altar. You, you know, it's vain worship that you give me and I, I won't accept it. And what you need is for somebody just to lock the door so you can't get in there. And finally, and we talked about this, uh, was it Sunday or last week? That God said, you know, you won't listen to my word, so I'm going to give you a famine of my word. I'm not going to let you hear my word anymore. And for 400 years, God didn't speak. The written word was there, and the righteous remnant that wanted to know what God's will was could look at Daniel and the other prophets, and they could see that these events that were happening during that 400 year period were all foretold by the prophets and they could say, yeah, God, God's still in control even though he's not talking to us like he used to, he's still in control. This is exactly what Daniel talked about or this is exactly what Hosea talked about and so on and so forth. And they could see that God was still there. But he said, I'm not going to give you my word anymore. I'm not going to talk to you anymore. And those that weren't faithful, of course, just fell away. Jesus comes back in Matthew chapter 5, and we, we talk about this being the uh, Sermon on the Mount. We talk about the Beatitudes. Jesus said what God really wants. And remember, again, this is under the law of Moses. He said God wants you to be humble. He wants you to be meek, merciful, and pure in heart. Just to summarize the Beatitudes there. It was more of an attitude that God was seeking in the hearts of his people. Now if the attitude is right, what else is going to follow? Your, your actions, yeah, I would say your actions, but correct answer. If your attitude is right, everything else is going to fall into place because you're going to make it fall into place. Okay? And if you're not doing the right things, what does that say about your attitude? That's a bad attitude, the wrong attitude. Um, like the Pharisee who went up and began to pray, it says, thus with himself. I thought that was very poignant when Jesus said it that way. He prayed thus with himself. God, I thank thee that I'm not like other men. You know, and it went downhill from there. I won't continue, but you know, I mean the whole prayer just seemed like it went downhill from there. And, you know, he pointed over, and I'm not like this sinner standing over here pointing to the guy next to him that was praying that wouldn't even lift his head to heaven but looked down on the ground and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus said, he's the one that went home justified, not the Pharisee who prayed thus with himself. Because God didn't hear his prayer. Um, because he thought that because he carried the right card in his wallet, God would hear him just because he was who he was. And God, you're so lucky to have me on your side. Um, he, God kept crying to them over and over and over through the prophets that I want you to do my will. 
Just being the physical seed of Abraham doesn't mean anything to you. But they would not listen to him. And so God put them in place for a purpose. And initially, they began to fulfill that purpose. But uh, then, then it just got to where they weren't. And when they ceased to fulfill the purpose, God took them out as a physical nation. Now, there was a righteous remnant that was doing what God always expected them to do, and they got to keep their card as it was. But the rest of them were thrown out of the kingdom. And, uh, you know, these people, you'll, you'll hear... You'll see, I, uh, when I was in New York City, I don't know, about 20, 30 years ago, I got a little flyer from somebody there. I was walking down the street, and the guy handed me the flyer, and he was a Jewish nationalist, and it was explaining why we need to be sending money over to Israel. You know, God would bless the nation that blesses Israel and all of this kind of stuff. And I'm going, okay, I'd like to see some scripture for that. You know, it's not there. God's through with the nation of Israel. What was the final thing that told the whole world, whether they knew the Bible or not, told the whole world that God was through with Israel? Mm -hmm. Exactly. At, at that time, nobody could prove that he was a, could be a priest. What were the requirements for becoming a priest? It wasn't just that you were a Levite. You had to be one of Aaron's sons. And everybody up until AD 70 could trace their lineage all the way back really to Abraham. Couldn't they? But you know what? After AD 70 when the temple was destroyed you couldn't even prove that you were, you were of the seed of Abraham anymore because all those records were gone. You might say, now my mom and daddy told me. Well, so what? Your mom and daddy might have told you wrong. At that point in time, it was evident to everyone, no matter whether you were a believer or not, that God was finished with the Jewish nation. But they had this institutional concept of God's service. Now we talk about institutionalism a lot of times among ourselves and we're talking about the, uh, the, the things that happened in the 1950s and 1960s and so on with the split over what was commonly called institutionalism. That's not true institutionalism. That's church support of, of human institutions. That's a little different than the institutional concept of God's people. Most people in the world today have an institutional concept. Webster says that institutionalism is an emphasis on the organization, as in religion, at the expense of other factors. Doesn't that describe exactly how the Jews felt about their kinship to God? Doesn't that describe how many, yes, of our own brethren feel about their kinship to God? I was baptized, you know, uh, Brother Turner wrote this material and he wrote, and I wish I could remember the poem, it's called, I'm, I've Been Baptized. And he was talking about, I've been baptized by that preacher who's famous for being so queer and, and all of this kind of stuff. And he goes on and on, you know, I've been baptized. You know, I'm a card-carrying member of the Church of Christ, therefore, you know, I'm fine. And that's just exactly what was wrong with, with the Jews in Jesus' day. And that's not what God wanted for his people. Um, he wanted something better for them. And so, okay. And so God used men to set forth his laws. That's absolutely true. But were those men the source of the laws? Not at all. Turn to Galatians chapter, well, turn to Matthew chapter 16 and read verse 18. Does anybody know it by heart?
Go to go to through nineteen. Loosed in heaven. Okay. <laughs> Lost in heaven. Okay. Turn to Matthew eighteen and let's read verses. I think it's probably eighteen and uh, no, verse eighteen. Yeah, given to all of the apostles at that point. He gave it to Peter first, then he gave it to all the apostles. Now, the King James and those manuscripts or those translations that are based upon the King James translations say it a little bit differently. And I think even the American Standard says it incorrectly. Whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. But that's not what the words really say. In the Greek, the words say shall have been. In the past tense. Whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. In other words, the only thing the apostles were allowed to speak was what the Holy Spirit gave, was as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. That's what's being said there, literally. And if the Holy Spirit didn't give them utterance on something, they were not going to be allowed to speak it and teach it. It had to be what God had already decided was truth. And anything else was falsehood and they weren't going to be able to teach it. Turn to Galatians chapter 2. And let's read verses 11 through 14. That's fine. Um, so in Galatians chapter 2, we see that here was this inspired apostle, Peter. Did his inspiration keep him from committing sin? Not at all. Paul had to go up there and, and withstand Peter to the face and tell Peter he stood condemned. So even with the power of the Holy Spirit being with him, it didn't keep him safe. Peter had to make some decisions for himself. And he had to make the conscious effort to turn away from sin and turn toward righteousness at all times or it wasn't going to happen. So, in fact, these men who had the Holy Spirit, they could only teach the truth by the Holy Spirit, but that didn't mean that they couldn't sin. But they were not allowed to get together and decide what church doctrine was going to be and then impose that upon men. Some people look at the uh, council that was in, in uh, Acts, what was it, 18? 15, thank you. Um, yeah. The council at Jerusalem, well, you know, all these preachers got together and they decided upon what was going to be right. It wasn't what happened there. The other disciples or the other apostles and many of the disciples in Jerusalem had questions about Paul teaching the Gentiles the truth. And they said, what in the world is Paul doing? And Paul went to them and began to talk to them. And they said, wow, we've seen all of these. We've seen this power of the Holy Spirit. And it's undeniable what's going on here. The Gentiles have also been ushered into the kingdom. And so... It was not a counsel to decide truth. It was a counsel to listen to the truth, if you will. And, uh, and Paul and Barnabas, you might say, set them straight. Now, just because someone today 
is a preacher or the son of a preacher doesn't mean that they're right. You know, we have in many of the guys that I went to Florida College with are, are preaching the gospel now, and many of their fathers were preachers. And uh, oftentimes, you know, when a man becomes a preacher, his son will become a preacher. And this is especially true in India, because the oldest son is typically thought in India that it, he should take up the family business. You know, whatever that is, he should go into the family business. So if daddy is a Hindu priest, then the eldest son should be a Hindu priest, you know, or, and so on and so forth. And it carries over to the Christians there because that's their culture. But the fact that my daddy was Mr. Famous Gospel Preacher doesn't mean anything. But I've heard some of these guys, you know, on Facebook, you know, I hear, get all these comments and stuff. And I've seen one or two of them on Facebook come out with a thing of, you know, well, my father taught me this, and I've taught this all my life, so it must be right. That doesn't hold water. That isn't what God wants. He doesn't want an institutional religion. You think of Eli's sons, for example. You know, Eli was one of the most faithful prof or priests and prophets that there was of his day, but his sons were filthy, evil men. And Samuel uh, had to break the news to Eli that God was going to destroy Eli and kill his sons because of their evil and because Eli did not restrain them. Then later on, what happened with Samuel's sons? Same thing. Now it does not say, I'll, I'll say this, it does not say about Samuel's sons that they lay with the women at the door of the temple like it does about Eli's sons. But they took bribes and they perverted justice and so really they were just as bad as Eli's sons. But that has always struck me as being odd after Samuel saw what happened with Eli's sons that he didn't do a better job of teaching his sons. I, I can't be the judge of that. I don't know. He may have taught them and they may have made their own decisions. That's possible. That's right. And sometimes it just doesn't matter what you teach them um, and how diligently you are, you are about it because everybody is a free moral agent. We have the power to choose. And that's the way God made us, in His own image. God's a free moral agent. And so are we. And so we're made in His image. And I think that's one of the things that's meant there when it says we're made in the image of God. Um, but... Uh, you know, my daddy was a gospel preacher is not, does not authorize me to become one. Um. Okay. But all of these things, we need to under, these attitudes that we're talking about here have to do with an institutional concept of the church itself, of the people of God. That it's, an, it's, a, it's a box, if you will. And in that box, the people of God come to it and they receive the blessings that God has. And they're all in that box. And if you want them, you come to the box. You know, kind of like the toy box. If the children want the toys, they go to the toy box. Well, this is the blessing box, if you will, the institution. And those that are administering the institution have the authority to do that and to determine how that institution is administered. And God never set up the, his people to operate that way. And I think, are we about out of time? Got two more minutes? Okay. Um... 
study in Matthew chapter 5 a little bit this next week before you look at the next one, if you haven't already done so, in question number 5. And think about how the Beatitudes mimic the Ten Commandments. Um, because in reality, when Jesus talks about the Beatitudes here, isn't he really talking about the Ten Commandments? In effect. But what he's doing here is he's getting to the root of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not commit adultery. But what did Jesus say? Whosoever looketh who lust after in his heart hath committed adultery. And so here in the Beatitudes, Jesus gets to the root of that. You keep your heart pure. What did Proverbs in chapter 4 say? Keep thy heart with all diligence for... Anybody know? What? I think, I think you said it. Okay. Out of it spring forth the issues of life. That wasn't the translation I memorized it in, but that's close enough. <laughs> I, I get, uh, you know, I did most of my memorization in the King James Version because that was popular when I was little, and now it, I can't quote Scripture very well because I keep getting confused between translations. Um, I switch back and forth in the middle. But uh, keep your heart with all diligence. God never was so de con concerned with people's actions as he was with their heart because he understood from the very beginning that if their heart was right their actions would follow now that doesn't mean that if you just love God everything is going to magically fall into place what it means is if you love God like you should you're gonna make it fall into place and if you look at it that way you're looking at it the way the scriptures do okay